What are helicopter parents? We're going to find out this morning. And one of the articles I was reading today was uh, from the Washington Post. Is helicopter parenting ruining a generation of children? With us this morning is Rusty Lozano, who is a licensed professional counselor, to talk about that and much more. Rusty, good morning. You're on the Gary Sutton Show. How are you? Hi there, Gary. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I don't know how people are used to that kind of lingo, but for people that don't know what helicopter parenting is, tell us a little bit about helicopter parenting. Well, helicopter parenting is just that. You try to imagine a helicopter hovering above an incident, uh, just just kind of keeping an eye and overseeing how things are playing out. Well, a parenting style can be very much like helicoptering, just kind of always observing a child and their behaviors and their actions, making sure that their uh, decisions are safe, and sometimes actually stepping in and advocating for them. I was reading an article by Emma Brown this morning that uh, talked a little bit about a disturbing trend that she noticed during her 10 years as dean of freshmen at Stanford University. And she said incoming students were brilliant and accomplished and virtually flawless on paper. But with each year, more of them seemed incapable of taking care of themselves. And at the same time, parents were becoming more and more involved in their children's lives. They talked to their children multiple times a day, swooped in to personally intervene whenever something difficult happened. And from her former position as one of the world's most prestigious at one of the world's most prestigious schools, she said she came to believe that mothers and fathers in affluent communities have been hobbling their children by trying so hard to make sure they succeed and by working so diligently to protect them from disappointment, failure, and hardship that they're actually ruining them right now. Overhelping, if you will. Talk about that a little bit, if you would, Rusty. No, absolutely, I absolutely agree with that. You know, um, when I was uh, in my graduate program, it was a theorist named Bogotsky, and he talked about a child's uh, initial experience of the world being more family, being more derived from family. So they would observe family interactions, observe family uh, uh, type of, inter, uh, I guess, interventions, and they would learn about decision-making and choices. And then they would actually take that impression and apply it to themselves. Um, but now you're seeing uh, more of this interpersonal component for kids. It's, it's being a little bit less developed. Um, you know, a hovering parent actually slows autonomy. Um, children go through a stage of development where they start to make decisions on their own. They start to explore the world and, and increase likes and dislikes according to their own experiences. Um, I think that this is one of the things that, this is one of the components that are under attack these days as, as children are turning into young adults. And now we're seeing like the first generations of this uh, outcome uh, today. Um, so it impedes decision making and their decision making ability. When a child, you know, has an opportunity to make a choice and, and become more dependent and dress how they want and uh, like the foods that they want to eat or hang out with certain friends, uh, now you're seeing a stamp of approval from parents. And a lot of times you'll see advocation from a parent to uh, to either uh, drive uh, fr like grow a friendship with a particular person because they they think that it's a, a good fit for the kid, um, or you know having them involved in activities and sports that they think is good for the child, even though it may not be something that you know uh, the kiddo is necessarily interested in. I hear the word vicariously getting close there. <laughs> you know, you hear people say living, living vicariously through their kids many times. Is it is it that or is it more than that? I think that that's, that's part of it. You see a lot of the vicarious experiences and the vicarious influences with sports uh, in a drive to be successful right. in sports. But um, I, it's, it's getting close to that. But I think that it's more of a, a – at some point, you know, there was an arrangement that – I don't know what set it into motion, but I remember when I was, I was growing up, we would stay gone uh, and play in public and play outside. Actually, there was a ditch close to our house, and we'd go crawdad fishing. And we'd, we'd get on our bikes, and we'd stay out until we heard my dad whistle for us. Right. Um, and now it's like, you know, kids are around more often, it seems like, um, and they're indoors with electronics, and they're more accessible. And so I think that that's, that's a, one part of the element. But another is just, I think, uh, overall anxiety that is just really trended throughout all the households in America. Is it is it the Columbine effect, the post-Columbine effect a little bit? Is it a matter of... You know, where our parents used to want us to get out of the house, 
and we'd be out there as long as they knew where we were, we were okay. And then we come home, and you know, we kind of knew that the community out there was a reinforcing kind of body that was going to mm-hmm. reinforce their, you know, qualities that they were trying to teach. Uh, and then we got to this post Columbine period where you now say, "Geez, my kid might get shot today. My kid might get kidnapped. My kid might get whatever." I'm halfway yeah. afraid to let him out in society. Is there anything to that? Oh, absolutely. I, I think a lot of this started with uh, with uh, John Wallace and the abduction of his child at, at a mall. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the whole abduction scenario where kids are missing and, and, you know, things like that have happened and they're terrible, terrible uh, uh, events. But now that I think is, is social media and, and the Internet and has gotten broader and bigger and more powerful, you're hearing reinforcing stories like this. You even see it in the news uh, where there'll be five, five stories in a row of a shooting or five stories in a row of a fire or a kidnapping or a murder. And I think as, as parents watch this, it just kind of reinforces, wow, this place is pretty scary. And then you got the 24 seven aspect of that where the media moves into that area and then they're there and they just beat it to death for days on end. And, you know, now you get some sickos out there who come out and say, well, you know, uh, maybe this is a way of getting, what did the guy say the other week, getting in the limelight. Right, I'll go out and shoot up a school, or I'll go out and shoot up a church, yeah. or whatever I might want to do, or I'll go out and, you know, hold a bunch of kids hostage, or you know, whatever it might be. I mean, the whole thing just uh, is a different time. And yet, at the same token, by the same token, I guess the next question I would ask you is: Do parents still want their kids to be good, independ- independent, independent uh, people who, when they get out there, are going to be citizens who know what they're doing? I mean, or, or are we are we training people to be dependent? And uh, with the mommy and daddy will always bail me out kind of attitude. Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of both. I think the drive is to make sure that their their child, now that school and, and uh, finding a career, getting into college is so competitive, uh, there, a lot of times parents are playing the, the deck of cards or playing the hand the child has. Uh, and then there's also the interpersonal skills. Um, these kids go through, uh, kids and adolescents, they go through a period of, trying to develop their own persona and uh, they're consistently and, and they reach out and they try to make these encounters. But then whenever they make a mistake or something doesn't go wrong, uh, I think that that's when the autopilot comes in and, and you know, parent will swoon in and, and make things better for them. They'll argue the point or they'll advocate for their child rather than kind of letting a child experience these things on their own. We the, in this article I was reading this Julia Julie Lithcott Hames uh, from Stanford was was saying mm-hmm. we want so badly to help our kids by shepherding them from milestone to milestone and by shielding them from failure and pain, but overhelping, which is what helicopter parenting is, causes harm. She writes it can leave young adults without without the strengths of skill, will, and character that are needed to know themselves and to craft a life. Um, mm-hmm. That's a great point, I think. Oh, absolutely. And and you can even see this kind of trend uh, even bleed over into the animal kingdom. Uh, you know, we have cats, and uh, and one of them got out the other day, and his name is Tommy, and he has zero survival skills. Uh, this, this cat has zero instinct to go out and, and find a food source, zero instinct to, to survive. It's just a big, fluffy cat. Right. But given the circumstances, had this cat grown up outside and and develop some of these instinctual skills, uh, you know, he'd become a survivalist and, and you know, thri- live and thrive. We have the same instinct, you know, as as a human and as a, as a genus and species um, to to live and, and find this instinctual drive to make these decisions and learn from our mistakes. But that that particular course of action has to happen for, the, for us. The kids and individuals, young adults, have to make these mistakes. And as parents, we have to kind of step back and, and not criticize and judge uh, a mistake or decision they made, but really be supportive in whatever route and decision they decide to go in. You know, it's amazing. I, we have three cats at home. And they're all house cats. And, and one, got yeah. out, one, one got out one time. And it got lost. And it got lost like 10 feet from our house over at the neighbor's house. My wife was frantic, and I was out there, and I started calling, and finally heard this meow, meow, meow over in the bushes. And the thing <laughs> went, I'd go over and sat there all day. So our cat, and I, I said to my wife, you know, it's kind of interesting, and you think, these they've lived in the house the whole life. They've been dependent mm-hmm. on us totally. I mean, they meow. You, you think you're never going to feed them. They meow all the time. <laughs> right. And yeah. and so, you know, but when they get outside, they don't know what the house looks like from the outside, only from the inside. And so we never have let our cats go 
um, mm-hmm. to go out there and experience stuff. Conversely, we have a station mascot here. His name is Socks. He's got two homes outside here, and <laughs> yeah. but he lives on his own out in the fields and stuff. And he shows up here for breakfast every morning. And yeah. Carol Mummer, who's our receptionist, feeds him every single day. He's he's been around here for like. 10, 12 years. I mean, this guy, this guy's a survivor, and you see him come in, he's cut up every now and then, but the guy's always here every morning. So mm-hmm. there's exactly what you're talking about. I mean, the independence uh, versus dependence, although he's dependent somewhat on us, but if if she didn't feed him, he finds other ways to go out and nab a mouse or something like that during the course of a day. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and right. nobody feeds him on the weekend. I mean, so he's out running around on the weekend. You see him come in Monday morning, crossing the road, coming in to get morning breakfast. So <laughs> it's amazing when you when you do that comparison, though. Yeah, yeah, it, and, it, and it makes perfect sense. And I think that there was an era that there was a time in history where there were other things going on and, and everybody had work to do. I mean, if you think historically about a family and household, and re- even in rural America, um, kids are actually made to work. Uh, the yeah. fields are work, work on a farm yep. uh, and, and have chores and duties, just like uh, the father and the mom and, and the uncle. Anybody who contributes to that household. We kind of blurred those boundaries a little bit, and uh, and I think that things are very comfortable, and it's great. It kind of says a lot about advancement of where we're going as a country and where we're going as a society. But at the same time, and, and you know, our intelligence is the best. Our, our you know, our access to knowledge is this is the information era. It's it's at our fingertips, and and there are a lot of comforts that make parenting and, and raising your uh, a stellar child an effective, very. Uh, a non-traditional, uh, uh, intelligent child, very easy, but then at the same time, we don't know how to handle that power because uh, a lot of times it's like the little bird sitting in a nest kind of meeping for food, and you know, and we have to decide, well, what is it that they need? When in actuality, um, they've grown dependent on us, and, uh, and now we've created the scenario. If you have questions, why don't you give us a call, 1-800-357-0910, talking with Rusty Lozano. Fascinating conversation about helicopter parenting. Rusty, you know, you see these things where it's like these kids are brilliant. They're doing well. They're they're really good on the paper. They're they're good at writing down their problems, doing their their math problems, stuff like that. And yet they get there and they have no clue on social skills. And I and I yeah. I look and I ask the, the age old question: How much uh, does the smartphone and the computer have to do with this? Where you're not really having to deal socially anymore. I mean, we all have the stories of going out to the restaurant or going out somewhere, and you see the family of four sitting around, and each one has their device, and they're dealing with the device but not dealing with each other and, and you wonder are our kids missing out there on the social skills i was reading an article last night where robots are taking over more and more a lot of the jobs and the assembly lines and so forth but in areas where social skills are needed those that have the social skills are prospering right now in areas like uh, uh the medical field and so forth so i mean how much of a role does does the it stuff have to do with this oh i mean i think tremendously it's it's a it's a curse, and it's also a blessing. Uh, but, you know, one of the trends that I see in my own office and in my own population of, of patients is I work with adolescent kids, and, and they have just this exuberant, incredible personalities on text. They can actually relay humor and laughter and and any sort of emotion on text, and they have even these little emojis that they use for uh, facial gestures. And there was one particular kiddo that comes to mind um, that was was courting a little girl and, and you know was trying to get closer and establish right. a relationship and they had a excellent conversations through text and then he said that he'd, he'd walk up to her school or they'd see each other and he'd walk up to her and just say hey and and not really know how to interact with her but, and and you know and then turn around and text say oh it's so good to see you and you know how you been and, uh, <laughs> but then couldn't actually uh, close that type of behavior like face to face and and that's a that's a huge uh disadvantage for kids and it's a lot of and, and that's a, that is another story just waiting to be written um but i think that the interpersonal skills and how we can actually shape and develop our children's social skills so what advice would you give when we come back that's going to be the big question here rusty what advice can we give to the parents let your kids you know let them go a little bit and how do you let them go that's always the big question I remember one of the best lessons I ever learned was when I sledded down a hill, sledded into a barbed wire fence, cut my hands up, had to come inside. My mother put Bactine on it, which she put on everything. You got a broken leg, she put Bactine on it. Wrapped them up with gauze and said, you know what? Did you learn a lesson? I said, yeah. Don't go down the hill into the barbed wire fence again on my sled. She said, good learning. Next case. Welcome back to the Gary Sutton Show. We're talking about helicopter parenting and our over-parenting. 
And, uh, you know, I got kids out there right now. They're saying they're ruining a generation of kids are these helicopter parents that won't, won't let their kids uh, up for air, so to speak. Rusty Lozano is a licensed uh, professional counselor. He's with us this morning here on the Gary Sutton Show. You know, it's interesting. I was reading more of this article. <laughs> One, one lady said, our job as a parent is to put ourselves out of a job. We need to know that our children have the wherewithal to get up in the morning and take care of themselves. So if you ask the question, am I a helicopter parent, what can you do to get away from that? What can you do to help your kids become self-sufficient, teach them the skills they'll need in real life, give them enough leash to practice those skills on their own? What do you do, Rusty? Well, I think there are a number of things that you can do. Um, a, recognize... Uh, your child's limitations and where they are in development. And I know that this may take some insight uh, and maybe even reading up on, on some resources to learn more about this. But, uh, you know, some basic things you can do is let your child make mistakes. Uh, you know, they're, they're going, everybody makes mistakes. <clears throat> that's how you learn to, that's how you learn to perfect your skills. Um, you know, you, you don't get up on a bicycle when you're learning to ride and just, take off you know you buy one and you're able to ride you get to fall over and you know learn to navigate i mean there, there are several steps and so you, you watch that process with your child um practice choice giving you know um you hear your choices son you can either choose to uh, have this for dinner or you can choose to have this for dinner or you can choose to play this sport or choose to play this sport which do you prefer and let them make their choice and then support it uh you know don't influence uh, or try to to coerce the decision based on what you think is in their best interest. Now, there are some times that we do have to step in and do that, and I think that that will be very evident to know when, when you, you step in and you don't let them make their own choice because it's, it's not in their best interest. You know, my, I'm trying to teach my son how to save money, and, uh, and he has $60 saved up, and he's, he's nine years old, and we were just walking around Bass Pro Shop the other day, and he goes, oh, I'm going to get this. And so then I, I just kind of asked some careful questions about it. I was like, well, is this something you really want to want to get? Is this more of a, hey, this is cool. Let's let's go ahead and just right. buy it because I have the money. And so then there's a lesson. So you can actually spend some time just uh, really it, it, just investigating and, and exploring the decisions. And without actually having to say, no, nah, you're not going to get that. Um, right. and, and say, well, you know, I know that you've had intentions of doing something else with your money. What about that fishing rod that you really want to save up for? Uh, and, and really, you know, place that kind of ideation in them. Because kids are going to forget. Um, so you're communicating. Gonna, I mean, you're communicating. Yeah. You're listening. You're planting some seeds right there. You know, the other thing, too, it seems to me, stop blaming someone else when your kid goes down. Stop, you know, start looking and having some self-accountability and accountability for what your kids are doing as well. Doesn't that, is that, is that off base? Oh, no, absolutely not. I think the accountability and uh and following through with you say with doing what you say you're going to do. If you commit to a sport or you commit to something, uh, you know the child you reinforce. Well, look, this is a decision you made, and these people are counting on you. And so, yeah, the communication is very key, and and having them be accountable for the decisions and and supporting and reinforcing that uh, and this is a choice that they've made. Um, there's a legalistic kind of attitude out there today. You, you know, something goes wrong. Well, it couldn't be my kid's fault. It's It's got to be the adult's fault or someone's fault over there. And and you get tired of kind of seeing that after a while, too, because a kid never has to stand up on their own. And then they know they can also play their parents any way they want to, right? Yeah, you know, that, that leads right into enabling. You know, and, and kids are really, really keen to that. It's not that they're manipulative. It's just that, you know, they're very aware of uh, of the power that they're starting to develop, you know, to, to influence or, or make decisions in their life. And the parents kind of stand back and let it happen. Yeah, we all so, we all tested our parents at some point in time, I think, going up. We all understood where, where you went to and where you didn't go to. Uh, yes, absolutely. And, you know, and sometimes whenever you they no is no and, like, you push the envelope, you know, for me, I'd get the end of a belt, you know. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I did, too, occasionally. Yeah, for sure. Hey, uh, you know, and that was a different era for sure. Rusty, uh, I, I really appreciate you being with us. When I can talk about this forever, I hope we can do it again sometime soon because there's really a lot of good points made there this morning. And uh, tell the helicopter parents, quit hovering so much. Don't be afraid for a skin knee now and then or someone to fall down. They'll get back up. Uh, Rusty, thanks so much for joining me this morning. Uh, can we do it again soon? Absolutely, Gary. Thank you very much for having me. I Thank really you very much. You, you too, you. And, and me too. Yeah. Thank you. Rusty Lozano with us on the Gary Sutton Show on helicopter parenting. We'll talk more about that later on and, and what you think about helicopter parenting. Yeah, we'll get your take on that.